Well, comrades, um, I've been to Pakistan several times over the last 20 years. And I've attended um, conferences of uh, our organization there. Um, <clears throat> when I've been there, I visited some of the poor areas of Lahore. I've been to some very poor rural areas. And it's incredible to think what conditions people have to suffer in the 21st century. If you compare it to the level of technology and the development we have in the advanced capitalist countries. It's a, 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 an immense contradiction of capitalist society that we have uh, this, this uh, immense polarization of wealth on a global scale with immense poverty in some parts of the world. Um, now, people can tolerate these conditions for decades um, when it seems there's no way out. Um, some sections of the population um, can be benefiting from a partial, say, a development of the economy for certain periods. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, the suffering continues. But even when it seems that nothing is happening, it's not true that nothing is happening. Something is happening. There's an accumulation of uh, suffering, of experience, of growing indignation, that eventually surfaces in mass movements. And until they surface, you can have, a, uh, on the left, you can even have a depressed mood, oh, the workers, they'd never move, nothing's going to happen. You hear a lot of that. And I'm sure a lot of you young ones will have heard that from older people who say, we've been there, you can't change society. And yet in Pakistan, <clears throat> 50 years ago, in 1968, there was an eruption of a mass movement. It started with a student movement, and it was Pakistan's 1968. It wasn't just France, May 68. 68 was a year of revolution, Mexico, Pakistan, and, and, um, and, and other countries. And here we are 50 years later, on the verge of what I would say is a new 1968. Um, we're seeing it in France, particularly. Um, and we're seeing it with this new movement of the Pashtuns in, in, in um, Pakistan, which we'll go into in, in, in a minute. Now, um, the conditions, <clears throat> as I said, in Pakistan, um, you have a situation where 100 million people in a population of 200 million uh, have no access to safe water. Uh, 94 million have no access to ad adequate sanitation. These are the conditions in which a huge part of the Pakistani population live. A huge percentage of the population is living in, um, in poverty. Now, <clears throat> on top of that, you have events which are shaking the consciousness of the people of Pakistan. <clears throat> One of them, of course, is what has been happening in neighboring Afghanistan. The intervention of uh, U.S. imperialism in particular um, has destabilized Afghanistan and that destabilization has spilled over into, um, into Pakistan. In reality, the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan in many areas is a very porous border, especially when you consider the people living on either side of that border are the same people. Bashtuns are divided by that border. It's an unnatural uh, border created by imperialism. But you have events. Last year, we were talking about the killing of Mashal Khan, a young left activist, a sympathizer of the INT. He was actually, I didn't realize at the time, he was one of my friends on Facebook. He was lynched and killed by an uh, Islamic gang. We have the experience of uh, two years ago, nearly two years ago, 200 workers who died at the Ghadani yard uh, um, oil tanker that um, uh, uh, blew up, killing um, a huge number of workers. And this is not the first time this has happened in Pakistan. Several occasions we've had fires and workers have not been able to escape. We have the ongoing terrorism. You know, they talk about terrorism in Europe, which is always terrible, what happened in France and what has happened in other areas. It's terrible, but it's nothing compared to what the people of Pakistan have had to suffer. 
daily bombings in some areas. It's happening all the time. Um, there was a, it's a, a bit of a sick joke, but a running joke in Pakistan is um, if there's a day when there isn't a bomb blast somewhere in Pakistan, that's news. Because every day somewhere um, in Baluchistan or in Kashmir or in the, wh wherever, um, there is some terrorist attack uh, taking place. And the number of victims is, is immense. We had um, two years ago in the Indian part of Kashmir, affecting obviously the consciousness in, in Pakistan, uh, the movement of the Kashmiris where they faced um, the Indian army firing bullets into unarmed protesting crowds, blinding a huge number of people in, um, in the process. Um, you have the doctors' um, dispute in 2016 with a brutal attack, with many of them hospitalized and seriously injured. This is what's happening. I've just, I've just listed a few small examples of the kind of things that are going on in Pakistan. And it seemed like an endless nightmare. Um, growing poverty, factories closing, uh, growing unemployment, um, serious uh, uh, social problems in the country. On top of that, the terrorism. On top of that, the state repression. Um, and it, you can understand why some people will think, when is this going to end? How is this going to end? Um, and what we have in the recent period is this magnificent movement of the Pashtun people. Um, how did it start? It started like other things we've seen. If you remember Tunisia um, just a few years ago, the spark that lit to the Tunisian revolution was an individual who committed suicide. How many people had committed suicide in Tunisia before then? Many, many. But they didn't provoke a mass movement. One particular suicide provokes a mass movement, <clears throat> like the one in Tunisia, which doesn't bring down just the regime in Tunisia, but spreads to Egypt. Now, was it the suicide that caused the mass movement? No. The, the mass movement is a product of decades of accumulation of poverty, of suffering, um, of indignation of the masses who see no way out, and it builds up and it builds up. And then, it's like a, a powder keg, a little spark can set up a huge, can set, uh, set in motion a huge uh, movement. And what happened earlier this year in January was a 28-year-old shopkeeper um, belonging to one of the Pashtun uh, tribes um, was killed um, by an infamous police officer called Rawan Anwar renowned for being involved in, in serious repression um, in, in the past period. That's not the first case of somebody being killed by the police in Pakistan. It's not the first case of somebody disappearing. One of the things which the Pashtuns are demanding is, where are the 32,000 people who have disappeared over the recent years? Are they alive? Are they being held and being tortured? Have, have they been killed? Um, it's been going on. Th those 32,000, one by one, didn't provoke this movement. But the accumulated, qu you know, the, the quantity, you can say, in Marxist terms, of this level of repression, suddenly the killing of one individual sets in motion a movement like the one we're witnessing now of um, the Pashtun uh, people. And um, the irony of it is, this is considered one of the most backward areas of Pakistan. It's a tribal area, an area where actually the, the laws of Pakistan and the constitution doesn't apply. You have tribal laws applying in some of these areas. And very conservative, for example, normally women wouldn't be participating in protests. Media uh, in Pakistan, serious journalists have commented on this significant development of the number of women taking part in this mass movement of the Pashtuns, which is unprecedented. It's an indication always in revolutionary movements where the masses begin to move, you see the entry into the mass movement of a huge layer of women. Women who would have been previously and still downtrodden in Pakistan, they're second class citizens. You know that if you want to get a divorce um, in Pakistan, a woman a woman's vote, a woman's position only counts half of a man. Um, this is the situation. Women cannot go to meetings 
if their father, their son, their brother, their father-in-law, any male member of the family can object and that woman cannot go to a meeting. That's how difficult it is for women, sorry, to get involved in political activity. So when you see this number of women coming out, ordinary working class women, peasant women, um, poor women, it's because they've been directly affected. Their husbands, their sons, their brothers, their neighbours, they've disappeared, they don't know where they are. Once that reaches a certain level, the anger of those people becomes unstoppable and it turns into a, a mass movement like the one we have now. Um, and what, are the, what is the movement demanding? Well, one of the things is that the, 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 the officer accused of carrying out this killing should be brought to justice. Uh, they're calling for an end of state repression in all the tribal areas of Pakistan. Um, the removal of the army checkpoints where ordinary people on a daily basis just to move from one area to the other are humiliated by um, the military. Um, the, uh, they want an end of discrimination. They want a clearing of the landmines that have been planted in the tribal areas, um, which have caused endless suffering. People killed, people's um, uh, limbs being ampu amputated as a result, and many children being killed. And the core demand, of course, is to know where the 32,000 missing people are. Are they alive? Are they dead? Tell us where they are. You see the interviews of, of people who say, we've been waiting for years, we don't know where, you know, where my brother is, where my son is, where my father is. Um, and that kind of condition is what can set in motion a whole people. And that is what has happened in, um, um, in Pakistan. Um, and the Pashtu people have started to mobilize in their hundreds of thousands, uh, rallies of tens of thousands of people. And a figure has emerged, a young man of 24 called Manzur Pashtin, um, who basically has become like the tribune of the people. He speaks what the people have been thinking for, for a long time. Um, he, he describes events which many people have seen. For example, here I'm quoting from an article from our comrades who quote what, 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 what he, he, he describes. He described one incident where he saw children and women being killed in an aerial bombing by the Pakistan Air Force. Ordinary, innocent people. He was an eyewitness to that bombing and he saw the killings. When he finally got uh, to a safe place in, in, um, in the nearby city, he saw that the media was reporting that several terrorists had been killed in an aerial attack. That's how they present it. That's actually how they're trying to present this Pashtun movement. They're sort of pro-terrorists, they're um, uh, Islamic and all the rest of it. In actual fact, this is a protest against the Islamic elements as well, political Islam, um, because they're fed up of being um, um, bullied and oppressed by these people also. He's witnessed the destruction of homes, um, the looting by army personnel, um, the bullying of a whole, of a whole people. And he's giving that expression. And when he speaks, he's basically expressing the thoughts of millions of Pashtun people. And that's why he's so popular and he's become the figurehead. Now, if you see the pictures on the internet, you see these huge rallies of, of, of Pashtuns turning out um, to hear him speak and, and other speakers. Um, but it's, it's got the potential to spread because Pakistan is not a country with just one minority, you know, the Pashtun minority. There are the Baluchis, there are the Sindhis, there are the Hazaras within uh, the, the, the Baluchistan area, there are the Kashmiris, and there are many other smaller um, ethnic uh, groups. In fact, Pakistan, like many states that were created by the imperialists before they left their former colonies, are artificial states. They're not natural expressions of, say, one people. You know, Italy, more or less, is the border that unites Italian-speaking people. France, more or less, unites French-speaking people, apart from a few here and there. Pakistan is very far from that kind of situation. There are many different ethnic groups. Um, in Baluchistan, you have an ongoing uh, conflict between the state and the Baluch, different Baluch nationalists. Um, so the, the Pashtun movement has the potential to spread beyond the Pashtun people, to link up with the Baluchis. And for instance, in Quetta, 
the, uh, the, 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 the main city of, of Baluchistan, there was a rally of 50,000 people. And there were Baluchis, there were Hazaras participating um, in, um, in that rally. So the potential is, um, is there to spread. And because of the size of the movement, it has really rattled, it's shaken the state apparatus of um, Pakistan and the ruling class um, itself. Initially, their first reaction was to try and repress. But as soon as they saw how big the movement was, they realized they had to back off because to continue with the repressive measures in the face of a mass movement risked making the movement even bigger. And now you have generals uh, saying that, um, oh, the Manzoor Pashtin is, is a wonderful boy, um, a nice young man, and we must talk to him. And there's a general who's come out and said, well, the Pashtuns do have reasons to protest and they have a case and we must listen to them. They never said that before. When there was no mass movement, they just carried on with, the, with their repressive operations. Now faced with a movement which risks becoming a general conflagration, they're prepared to sit down and talk. Now, that's not the um, position of an honest ruling class, clearly. What they're doing is they realize um, that they have to try and uh, play a waiting game, hoping that the movement will eventually recede and they can regain control. Um, what they're trying to do, and there's a danger there, is to try and isolate the Pashtun movement to the Pashtuns and push them into a nationalist direction, i.e. instead of linking up uh, with the other peoples of Pakistan, isolate them and divide. The classic tactic of divide and rule. Um, uh, it's clearly that's, that's, with, that's their intention. But at the same time as they show the nice face um, in an attempt to try and di so-called dialogue with this movement, they seek out the most radical uh, elements and individuals and go for them and um, um, clamp down um, uh, on these um, people. What's happened in Pakistan is this also. The the, all the traditional uh, historical parties, such as the PPP, such as the Muslim League and, and, and others, are totally discredited in the, in the eyes of the mass of the people. Uh, you saw that in the elections. Um, but in the eyes of the Pashtun people, it's the whole of the state institutions which are discredited. There's been a massive leap in consciousness. That's what's taken place. In normal times, you have to argue your case about what the state is, what is the nature of the state. Um, the potential brutality of the state. For the Pashtun people, everything they've suffered has shown them clearly what the nature of the state is. And you know, it doesn't require, I don't think they have to read State and Revolution to understand the nature of the state, like you may have to in Sweden or Canada or even here in Britain. Um, but, that, but that will change here too, of course. Now, um, this movement of the Pashtuns, as I said, is unprecedented in, in its scope and has revolutionary potential within it. And the Marxists in Pakistan, our comrades of the of Lal Salam, have fully supported the Pashtun movement. They've supported all their demands. But as Marxists, we don't simply support. We also try and give a perspective, an analysis, and a way forward um, for such a movement, and also warn against the dangers that a, such a movement can face. And one of them is, of course, that not having a working class-based leadership, not having a leadership which consciously tries to link with the working class, they could be pushed in the direction of nationalism, even from within. There are elements, and it can be a natural reaction. Um, one of the things which I've heard some Pashtuns uh, saying is, well, the Pashtuns are moving, but the others aren't. The Baluchis, are, what are they doing? What are the Sins doing? What are the, uh, all the others? They're not doing anything. Suddenly, and I, and I said to a comrade, yes, we should tell them, but what were you doing until yesterday as a people? You were in the same position, without any hope, without any idea that anything could be done. You've now reached a point of understanding and have moved the Baluchi people can reach the same conclusions. The Sindhis can reach the same conclusions. All of the peoples of Pakistan, the Punjabis, 
who were, who were considered, I suppose, the, more, the, the people who live in the most advanced area and therefore seem to be as being more oppressors as a people. But the mass of the Punjabis, they live, they live in similar conditions. It's only the ruling elite within that national grouping which plays a, a, an oppressive role. Um, having been the, the people that moved, they should consciously work to help the other peoples of Pakistan to reach the same conclusions that the Pashtuns have been reaching in this period. That's the task. If that's not done, then the Pashtuns can remain isolated. And then from the idea, we're moving but nobody else is moving, you can move in another direction, which is separate, um, we, 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 we need to break with the rest of Pakistan, and move in a nationalist direction, which, if you consider the position of the ruling class, of Pakistan, from their point of view, it's much better to have a push to nationalist movement moving in the direction of separating from the rest of the people than uniting, because they can divide the people and by so doing, they can um, uh, crush them. Um, so we have to warn at the same time um, as, as, as we, um, we support. And we have to explain the, um, that this crisis this uh, mess that exists in Afghanistan and Pakistan is a direct consequence of one, imperialist intervention in, uh, in the region, which has created this mess. Let's not forget that the um, Islamic fundamentalists didn't uh, come from nowhere. They were actually promoted by US imperialism at the time of the, the uh, regime in Afghanistan that came to power with the Saur Revolution in 1978. A progressive regime, with, it, with its limits, but nonetheless a progressive regime. A regime which did these, you know what a terrible thing the regime did, the Saur regime did? They passed a decree banning the selling of women. What a terrible criminal thing to do for a regime. That's what they did. And other uh, reforms were introduced, and, but because it moved in the direction of the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union at the time. The Americans did everything to undermine that um, regime. And one way they did it was to promote the Islamic fundamentalists and the so-called freedom fighters, the Mujahideen. I remember Ronald Reagan referring to these people as the freedom fighters. So long as they were fighting the Russians, they were freedom fighters. The problem is, of course, they come from some very backward areas with some very backward also um, uh, views. Um, they didn't like the Russians being in Afghanistan, and they didn't like the Americans being there either. And they were extremely reactionary, but they were promoted initially by US imperialism as a counterweight to a progressive force in Afghanistan. It's not the only place they've done it, by the way. Uh, Hamas was created, um, sponsored by US imperialism and Israel itself, as a counterweight to who? To the PLO, who at the time were considered uh, progressive. You go to many countries in the world and you'll find this phenomenon of seeking out some reactionary group or layer or force within society as a counterweight to the progressive layers uh, basing themselves more on the working class and the youth. And that's what we have in Afghanistan and Pakistan. These now have emerged as a force and the state pretends to be fighting them but in reality they're using them and they're collaborating with them. And in the meantime, it's the ordinary people that suffer. But this is part of a general crisis of, um, of the system. Now, in this context, we have the arrest of our comrades. Because in the movement, our comrades in Pakistan have posed the most advanced slogans. They've explained, you must connect with the working class. You must connect with the rest of Pakistan. You must consciously seek to build a movement that unites with the rest of the people of Pakistan. Um, and they explain to them that the reforms and the demands you're trying to get with this state are impossible to achieve because this state defends the interests of a corrupt um, uh, Pakistani bourgeois and defends the interests of imperialism. And um, because of this, the state has targeted our comrades in Pakistan. Now, there are some people on the left who have had the gall to say that this, these arrests were a gimmick. They were uh, engineered. Basically, the comrades uh, went out and did something to get themselves arrested just to get a lot of publicity. I'm telling you, 
you don't try and get arrested by the rangers in Pakistan. And the rangers are an extrajudicial force. They have special powers. They're responsible for the disappearance of many people. And the proof of the fact that it wasn't that is that before this event, comrades were visited by agents of the state and they were told to back off with their connections with the Pashtun movement. They were told to moderate their position and they were even asked to collaborate. And when the comrades politely refused, they were told, you be careful because you too can disappear. That was what was told to the comrades. Within a few days, one of those comrades who gently refused the offer was arrested. We're well, arrested. We can't call it an arrest because an arrest involves a police officer telling you what his name is, who he is, what you're being charged for, where your, your, your presence, where your whereabouts are known, and you have the right to a lawyer and to defend your case. That does not happen when you get abducted and you disappear. Um, and there was, nobody knew where, the, where these comrades were being held. Now, um, they, and they targeted our comrades, because the comrades were, were actually taken off a train. You could say, what happened today in Lahore, for instance, there was a left protest, a lot of different left groups, to their honour, came out in solidarity with the arrested, uh, with the abducted um, comrades in Pakistan. And in the process, over 30, about 35, were arrested today in Pakistan. About 10 of them were our comrades. Others were from other left groups. I think the Awami uh, Labour Party was there and, and other groups. But they were arrested by the police. I'm telling you, when I heard it was the police, I thought, Oof. when you're arrested by the police, at least legally, you have certain, <laughs> at least certain minimum conditions which have to be respected, i.e., first of all, they know you're at the police station, and two, uh, you have to be charged with something to be kept. In the end, they were all released today. The purpose of that arrest was simply break up the protest rally in solidarity with those who remain in prison. Now, they targeted the comrades. We immediately launched an international um, campaign. Um, we uh, sent inf the information out to comrades all over the world. We immediately published articles on our website and on our different websites explaining what had happened. We approached trade unionists, trade union branches, uh, uh, labor politicians, and we've, I, I believe we've had a fantastic campaign. It shows you actually what it means to be an international tendency. It's not just nice. It's not just that you meet lots of people from different countries. It's a real concrete tool in a situation like this. What happened? Well, for example, we got the leader of the Canadian Postal Workers Union, 50,000 members, Mike Palasik, who um, immediately wrote a letter to the Prime Minister of Pakistan demanding uh, uh, to know what had happened to these people and demanding their release and justice. Again, in uh, Canada, in Quebec, the leader of Quebec Solidaire, a left party in the Quebec Parliament, has written a letter to the Pakistani authorities demanding to know um, what has happened. Today, we had a member of the European Parliament, an Italian member of the European Parliament, of the left group in the, parla in the Parliament, adding her name to the protest. In Brazil, the National Executive Committee of the PSOL, a significant left party in Brazil, in which our comrades are attendancy. The National Executive sent off a letter protesting. In Argentina, two members of Parliament um, added their voice to, um, uh, to the protest. And we have a long list of trade unionists, trade union leaders, um, adding their names to, um, to the campaign. Um, we were told uh, yesterday that John McDonnell would uh, write a letter of protest if we give him all the, the information. Um, we've done this around the, around the world in many different countries. We organized pickets of the embassies. We went out all, outside consulates and embassies. We phoned them. We emailed them. We sent letters. Um, we've made them aware around the world that we know what you're doing. And this is, in reality, faced with, faced with the dangers which are involved in being taken by a, a, an organization like the Rangers of Pakistan, the only defense we have 
is to highlight as much as possible, publicise as much as possible, spread the word as much as possible, and get as much support within the labour movement and the student movement um, to protest to the authorities. And one thing these, these kind of uh, uh, state security bodies don't like doing is being put in the limelight, having the light shone on them to show what they do. And they're like, they prefer to work in the corridors. As a result of this, and another important development is um, Manzur Pashtin, the, le uh, the leader, the, the young 24-year-old leader, which I, 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 I quoted earlier on, came out with a, st a public statement two days ago, I think it was, who said, if the arrested protesters in Karachi are not released by the rangers, we will make an appeal to the masses to come out uh, on strike. So it's a combination of a leader of a mass movement which is preoccupying the, um, the state. And the idea, of course, is if you, if you continue with this oppressive measures, you will only provoke the Pashtuns even more, plus the mass, uh, the, 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 the mass leaders in, 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 in other countries and the international campaign, all of this put together has put pressure and today they released everybody they were arrested in Lahore. But um, initially they picked up four in Karachi, then they became seven, then they became nine. Now we have three left in prison. There's Bilawal Baluch, Mohammed Gulbaz, and Umar Riaz. Um, and we, at least now we know where they're being held. They're being held in the headquarters of the Rangers in, um, in uh, Karachi. Um, and uh, the way things are going, we're very confident, I think, that they will soon be released. The logic of the situation is this. But um, we have to keep up the pressure to make sure that that um, happens. Um, just to conclude, this level of repression that we see in Pakistan is uh, a reflection of the kind of society that we live in. The state is prepared to dedicate forces and resources to arresting or to abducting trade unionists, student activists, socialists, Marxists, who are simply expressing their opinion, who are simply expressing solidarity with the justified demands of the Pashtun people, and they get abducted and they disappear. The resources to provide the people with water drinkable water or sanitation, or to fight the poverty that exists. No resources for that, because the resources are in the hands of a minority, of an elite, of privileged layer of society, the ruling class and their hangers-on. And it's a reflection of the class society that we live in. If we want to put an end to this kind of repression, which is going on all the time, this is not the first time somebody has been arrested or abducted in Pakistan. Many trade unionists uh, are arrested and many people disappear. It's ongoing and it will continue to take place so long as capitalism exists and the capitalist state that defends the interests of the capitalists. So in the long run, if we want to put an end to this once and for all and remove this barbaric uh, situation from society, it requires a transformation of society in the direction of a socialist society, i.e. The, the advanced technology and the resources which exist must be placed in the hands of the people who produce the wealth, i.e. the workers of this world, and they should be allowed to run society in a different way. When that happens, we won't need the rangers. We won't need the military um, and their repressive measures um, because there will not be a privileged class that needs such bodies to defend its position in society. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Fred. I think uh, for, for a long period of time in Pakistan, uh, of course, we, were, we are experiencing in, in the media about the terrorist attacks and all these kind of things. Um, uh, saying that, uh, and drones attacks even, like, you know, we have this American drone attack and all these kind of terrorist uh, bombings and this kind of all sorts. Um, but then one thing uh, was missing, that why people are not like, uh, you know, showing the resentment against all these uh, happenings which are going on. It's quite brutality, but still, why people are not there? Um, 
but on the other hand, we see a lot of movements in Pakistan which are like quite automized, like uh, uh, workers' movement, for example. I mean, the things when uh, I will tell about this campaign, about the trade union solidarity campaign, and uh, uh, we reach out to different uh, workers in Pakistan and see their like movement erupting in different sections, in different departments, different uh, sectors. And they are like quite automized, and often uh, media is not totally reporting all these things uh, because uh, even if we see um, every day in Lahore, especially uh, the uh, press club, press club is a place where uh, often you get um, some kind of attention in, in any newspaper. So workers they often tend to hold a demonstration in front of either factory gates or uh, uh, press clubs. So we see continuously uh, uh, rising numbers of protests every day in Pakistan. And the press club road, one of my friends is also living just near press club road, and he's totally, uh, you know, anger, angry against all these protests because uh, his access to his house is often blocked by the road because the road is blocked by the there. And um, he said, like now, situation is that the the, uh, the government will just, you know, put a barrier and make it a protest place because there's so much happening. The thing is that there was no a joint voice for the last many years in Pakistan to actually, uh, you know, um, gather all the mood and sentiment of the of those atomized protest and uh, and resentments among the among the workers. So I think this uh, movement, this Pashtun Tahafuz movement, which have started, people are looking at it as uh, as a as a platform where they can actually raise their voice, or raise their voice about their. The oppression which they are facing by the state, by the by the capitalist, and all these kind of shops. Uh, on the face, it is of course uh, being seen as a Pashtun movement, but then we see that when this movement is uh, crossing beyond uh, the Pashtun area, going to Islamabad, going to Lahore, going to Karachi, and then we see all different walks, uh, people from different walks of life, are they, they are joining this this protest and 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 expressing their own uh, uh, anger against the, against the state. Because one way or the other, all of their problems are linked with the, with the brutalities of the state, either it's brutal nature or it's an oppressive nature. Uh, I mean, on the, on the face, a lot of people might think that this is a movement uh, just because uh, a Pashtun person was killed, Nakibullah. Nakibullah was killed in Karachi, so it's a, it's a kind of a very jolly guy, model, uh, model type of person, um, listening music, and so all. He has a Facebook account. I mean, if you go and see, he doesn't seem the kind of a terrorist. And of course, now the situation is open that he was not a terrorist, but he was killed by Rao Anwar, as Fred uh, uh, explained. And the situation in Karachi, you have to understand this: uh, that uh, after the Zia era, you know, the Karachi police and rangers were like given a lot of powers to arrest people, to harass people, all these kind of things. And then there were like thugs were also like you know nurtured by the state to harass the working class because Karachi has the largest proletariat population in Pakistan as a city, and uh, it's also the main port hub uh, of Pakistan. All the import exports from the countries going through through that particular area and region. Uh, so uh, the state had particular interest in suppressing and oppressing the working class <coughs> over there through different means and through brutal means. We are seeing the example of this uh, MQM, a, a kind of a neo-fascist kind of party uh, developed by, by the dictator Ziaul Haq. The leader of that, for, that party has of course uh, been like diluted quite a lot, but the leader is living in London here, right, up, right nearby here, and operating that party from here. So uh, this kind of uh, thing were all nurtured there and they were provided with, with weapons with, and they were like extorting people. So this kind of uh, this kind of situation was prevalent in Karachi, and, and police were also playing their part by by, you know, uh, getting uh, their part, their share of their pie uh, of these extortions and all these kind of things. So MQM was finished uh, politically and um, all ideologically also, uh, because they were based uh, from uh, uh, Mohajer movements, the, the the people who migrate from India, um, and then there was a vacuum of extortion and killings. So police stepped in. And then they, came, they took uh, this uh, business of like extortion and killing. And Rao Anwar was an expression of that particular phenomena of extortion and killings. Uh, people were like, of course, not happy with this with this guy, uh, this rascal. And uh, and of course, he was doing a lot of killings. There was a statistics a report that uh, around 444 killings he did in the last uh, 10 years. So around 400 people he killed. 
and, uh, and, and, and you can name countless uh, uh, extortions also. And then, uh, as Fred explained, Comrade Fred explained, um, uh, there has to be a point, like when the people will say that, like, okay, enough is enough. So this particular point of killing Nakibullah, a Mahsud, a, a Pashtun, became the tipping point of this movement, which was started as Nakibullah Tahafuz movement, and then it expanded into Pashtun Tahafuz movement. So that's also very interesting phenomenon, how the movement expands. And then particularly explains the situation in, in Pashtun area, uh, the bombings, the killings, the terrorism, and all these kind of things, uh, the anger which was building up for the last 15 years after especially the, uh, the war on terror, uh, the World Trade Center thing. Uh, and after that, the whole uh, brutality was actually played down on that particular area. So that build up of this anger was expressed now in Pashtun Tahafuz movement. And now we see that this movement is like spreading across to different uh, cities, different uh, provinces. And now people are coming out with their own, uh, own problems. They're like, we, we are also facing issues. We are also facing problems. Now the, the most uh, uh, critical thing here is that is the movement uh, ready to accept or open their arms to, to the grievances of the other people, of other nationalities, of the other section of the workers? That has to be uh, seen uh, and, and still it has to be debated. Because what we see here is a lot of like this nationalist elements, uh, they are also in it, there are also some kind of reformist element, state elements also we find this kind of expression within this Pashtun movement. But overall, the leadership, the key leadership, like uh, Manzur Pashtin, has become like quite uh, quite open about uh, about defending the interest of all sections of uh, of the workers, uh, especially when when you give a call about uh, about the kidnappings and all the things which uh, this abduction happened with the with the comrades, and they are not Pashtuns. I think two or three of them are Pashtuns. Uh, some of them are from Kashmir, from Balochistan, from Punjab, and. Uh, he openly supported them. He said, "Like, yeah, we, we should like support our uh, our sympathizer, our comrades, and we should go on a on a, on a strike and, and defend also uh, their their right to protest and everything." So, you know, this this thing uh, is happening here. And then, I mean, the the, uh, the when when this abduction happened, we were like, um, uh, you know, of course, everybody is like quite uh, quite concerned about that. He's, Rangers have, have gone to Karachi and targeted uh, comrades and picked them up and uh, took them to unknown location. You know. And uh, historically, if we see, I mean, if you just go on Google and uh, or YouTube, you just type Karachi Rangers killings, you can see number of videos there how they are like killing people on camera. You can find on camera killings there. You don't need to go to liveleaks.com. You just go to YouTube. You have you, you have their videos over there and how brutal they are. So that immediately created a kind of, kind of situation that uh, will our comrades be safe where they are, we, like rangers took them up, you know, all these kind of things, a lot of questions are happening. So then we initiated this kind of, this international campaign, and it was so successful that uh, uh, with this, our IMT uh, comrades all over the world, they immediately took up this campaign. They said like, yes, we have to defend uh, our comrades because injury to one is injury to all. And then we have, we see this magnificent campaign, you know, all over the world. And uh, I was making a list of um, the cities where comrades, they hold uh, uh, events, they hold solidarity events, demonstration in front of the Pakistani high commissions and embassies. They are in Toronto, Napoli, Prague, Ghent, um, Basel, Zurich, Bern, Geneva, Stockholm, London, Amsterdam, New York, Paris, Brussels, Liverpool, Rome, so it's, it's not in order. Uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York, Bologna, Kathmandu, Edmonton, and a lot of other cities where uh, comrades, they, they, the whole solidarity event, and, and they, they asked uh, the, the local MPs, the trade union leaders, uh, student uh, representatives to send letters to, to Pakistani embassy officials, to the prime minister of Pakistan, to interior minister, to, to release uh, these comrades which, are, which were abducted in, in Karachi by these uh, rangers, which are like brutal in terms of this extrajudicial killing. And so far the campaign was very, uh, very good and very great. So um, I think most of the thing has been covered by, by uh, Comrade Fred, so I won't uh, like repeat all this. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, the, the campaign, the uh, Pakistan Trade Union Solidarity Campaign. We started in 2006. 
uh, with the reason to connect the working class struggle uh, of Pakistani workers with, uh, with all over the world, the working class movement of the world. Uh, the reason being that is uh, for the long, lot, many time, long time, uh, uh, trade unions are actually banned in Pakistan. So workers, they don't, they don't have any platform to actually uh, collectively bargain uh, for their rights in, in the workplaces. And uh, the private sector, that's the worst uh, situation there because they are the most exploited workers in Pakistan. Uh, there's no health and safety, there's no workplace safety, even the, uh, the, the salaries are so low. And the minimum salary, which is, uh, which is uh, decided by, by the state, is not even paid to the workers. So they are too much oppressed. And recently, uh, with the disregard of any kind of health and safety, you have this building collapse, you have factory fires. That's, that's quite common uh, every, you know, every month happening in Pakistan. And of course, due to some reason, also not reported in the media. Uh, but somehow, the workers there are, are facing all these, these issues. Uh, so we initiated this campaign, and so far the campaign was very, very successful in terms of connecting uh, the, the Britain trade unions and the several trade unions in Europe with this campaign, uh, and to get solidarity from them in, in the different uh, campaigns going on in Pakistan. So uh, this campaign we have, and we also we are also producing um, a newsletter a bulletin, you can say. Uh, it's after every three months. Uh, there's there are a couple of copies here. Feel free to take one, um, uh, which we highlight. Uh, in that bulletin, the different uh, campaigns going on in Pakistan in different sectors, in railway, in, in, in medical sector, uh, in, in shipping, and in, uh, in all kind of uh, government sector. So we, we put all the reports over there. And, um, uh, and yeah, I would, uh, I, would, I would request you to, to take the copy. And, uh, and of course, if you have any question regarding uh, this campaign or uh, uh, regarding the, the issue of, uh, of of this particular campaign in which we are uh, um, we are doing right now regarding our comrades who are arrested. Right now there are only three comrades and hopefully by tomorrow uh, they will be uh, released. Uh, but if you have any questions, any, any comments, uh, feel free to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the Progressive Youth Alliance. Um, and the reason for this is that um, several of our comrades who were abducted are kind of leading figures and have been um, very active and kind of very just like important in um, this movement and they have been instrumental in raising the ideas of Marxism and emphasizing the need for revolutionary socialism within this movement um, kind of in a similar way that um, as we strive to do from the Marxist Student Federation um, in the student movement here in Britain but um, I would say that the similarity sort of ends there because our comrades who have been working in the PYA, the Progressive Youth Alliance, um, have had to deal with conditions that are so much more difficult and dangerous than what we would have to deal with um, in Britain. So um, I want to give a bit of background as to the environment within which our comrades have been working. Um, I think Fred covered quite well um, the general conditions of poverty and economic suffering in Pakistan. So I want to talk specifically about education. Um, so a big part of the population in Pakistan are illiterate. Um, I looked up some UNESCO statistics and adult literacy is about 50 to 55 um, percent. And this is because um, out of the people who are actually able to pay for a decent education, and as you can imagine that is not many, only 4 percent are able to reach um, higher education, so like university. Um, because most people are of course um, forced to go into employment from an early age um, in order to, um, learn their, to earn their livelihood. Um, and to be able to have food and shelter and clothing, etc. Um, and uh, for those small 4% of those who are able to pay for education, um, once they manage to get to university, to get on campus, they face basically the constant threat of being silenced and being repressed um, by state-sponsored thugs, um, like the Islamic Fundamentalist Organization, the IJT, which stands for Islami Jamiat i Talibah. I'm sorry, I do not speak Urdu. Um, so they face this constant um, threat of police repression and state repression, um, and even repression by bodies that aren't necessarily part of the state, but they're still endorsed and, as you said, nurtured, which I think is, I think is a very good expression, um, by the state. Um, and this could happen to them should they be critical towards the management of the university, um, the police, the army, the state, and just generally the status quo and the conditions that they have to live in. Um, so another big difference um, from Britain 
is that student unions and student politics are banned in Pakistan. Before being admitted to university, students are forced to sign a legal document where they basically have to promise that they won't be involved in political activities. And they could be suspended or even expelled if they violate this. Um, so basically this means that um, students have no platform nor, or like no channel to um, raise their concerns or to protest things like um, tuition fees being raised, which happens quite frequently, um, and just the quality of their education constantly deteriorating. They're not allowed to raise their voices and to speak out against this. Um, and critical thinking in general is strongly repressed and strongly sort of discouraged. Um, students who raise criticisms about the curriculum or the state supplied version of um, events and um, topics that are being covered in the curricula. Um, they are shunned by professors and by the management of the university. Um, so basically all efforts are being made to keep the students down, to not allow them to think for themselves or speak their mind. Um, and under the direction of the IMF and the World Bank, the Pakistani state is doing basically everything in its power to privatize um, state educational institutions. Um, so today, education is a very lucrative business um, in Pakistan, but um, even after spending millions of rupees on their degrees, um, a large portion of the youth still cannot find employment after graduating from university. Um, so um, with this background kind of in mind, um, in 2016, a mass movement of students erupted um, across Pakistan because of um, the exam papers being marked um, unfairly because students from state-run universities were deliberately given um, lower marks um, to kind of to make out that they achieved poorer results compared to private universities. And this is kind of a very cynical um, attempt to uh, justify the further privatization um, of university. Um, so students from the Progressive Youth Alliance played a very active role in this movement. Um, and they were basically raising the demands for free education um, and raising the need for an end to the class-based education system. Um, and as I was saying, this is kind of a context where you can see how their work and their demands are quite similar to ours in the Marxist Student Federation, despite the vastly different and much more difficult conditions. Um, and so, and as has already been mentioned, um, another important movement of Pakistani youth and students um, arose last year surrounding the, the murder of Mashal Khan, who is a 23-year-old journalism student um, at the university in Madan, um, who was killed after he was falsely accused of blasphemy, which is a crime that is punishable by death in Pakistan. Um, so he was um, a progressive student, as has been mentioned, and after the incident, um, when the police and the media visited um, his room, they found uh, portraits of Karl Marx and Che Guevara, um, and he had posters with uh, slogans written on them, like, workers of the world unite. Um, so as I said, in Pakistan, those who are found guilty of blasphemy face um, the death penalty. And in many cases, um, such as the case of Mashal Khan, um, guilt Basically, they don't, um, they don't even need to prove that this person was guilty of blasphemy um, because you have these state-funded gangs and thugs like the IJT um, who carry out executions without even um, proving that the person has committed a crime. Um, and actually, in the case of Mashar Khan, even the local police stated that there was no evidence um, of blasphemy in relation to his case and his killing. Um, and according to one of his friends, um, basically, the university's administration had planned this because um, Mashal Khan was raising his voice against uh, the general state of corruption um, in the university and he was in possession of documents that he was planning to release to the media. Um, and so this has been kind of a recurring phenomenon where the IJT has harassed and intimidated students uh, with similar tactics. Um, so you can see how uh, these thugs work in cooperation with um, the managers of the universities. Um, to crush the students and to kind of um, stop them from raising their voices against the problems that they face. Um, so the Progressive Youth Alliance um, have demanded um, the lifting of the ban on student unions and they have explained that it is only in this way, if the ban on uh, student politics is lifted, um, that there can be security in educational institutions. Um, and uh, the PYA itself has become kind of a platform where the youth can um, voice their concerns and their grievances and their anger. 
Um, there have been hundreds of students who attend PYA conventions across all of Pakistan. Um, and the PYA has also been successful in reaching out to um, oppressed nationalities in Pakistan like the Baluchis and the Pashtuns who face uh, barbaric repression from the Pakistani state. Um, and actually, our comrades who were arrested or were arrested for attending a protest in solidarity with the Pashtun Protection Movement, um, where they were calling um, for a linking up of all the movements of all the oppressed on the basis of a revolutionary socialist program. And I think the fact that the Pakistani state chose to target these comrades in particular shows how afraid they are of our ideas, the ideas that um, our comrades in Pakistan base themselves upon and that are also the same ideas that we here in Britain base ourselves upon. Um, so we have been absolutely appalled to learn of the abduction of our comrades um, and we are very thankful and very hopeful um, that um, several of them have been released and that hopefully the rest will be um, released tomorrow. Um, so I guess kind of on behalf of the Marxist Student Federation, we want to demand that um, our remaining comrades are immediately released and that they are released in good health. Um, we want to demand that the Pakistani government stop brutalizing workers and students through their campaign of state repression and extrajudicial arrests and killings. And we want to show our solidarity with the struggling workers and students in Pakistan by supporting the Pakistan Trade Union Solidarity Campaign here in Britain. Thank you.